I've, I've always been insatiably curious, and I also always did theater growing up. And um, perhaps that predisposed me to kind of dive into physics education research in that I felt like physicists, at least the theoretical cosmologists that, that I was working with, didn't always totally get, um, <coughs> understand this collaborative, this ensemble building that we do here. A and a lot of physicists prefer to learn by themselves, whereas I was always a collaborative learner. And um, physics education research shows, hey, most, pe most people actually are collaborative learners. Uh, <coughs> I got to work full, t I, got, I had the privilege of uh, spending full time thinking about how can we better facilitate learning uh, at Princeton for, 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 uh, in, in my role there for a few years. And then I moved to Toronto, and um, now I'm facilitating learning in the physics department at University of Toronto. And so I have a lot of experience trying to do active learning, interactive engagement, participant, learner-centered learning. Uh, however, the scale at University of Toronto is, is different. We can, ask, um, we can ask poll questions. When you are facilitating learning in whatever context you are in, it need not be. Mine is currently formal education, but it need not be. Um, what do you most hope your learner, learners will learn? B uh, big view, um, that it's okay to not be okay. <laughs> A love of science. Uh, dealing with data management behaviors is hard, but it's a lot easier if we work to change them together. My, my main goal for my students is to help them be able to use science to make better decisions and, and be better problem solvers, to be able to use evidence. And so how do I go about doing this? Um, so there's a physics education researcher at, at Rutgers, Eugenia Atkina, um, who developed this, this investigative science learning environment, learning cycle, she calls it. And so my goal is not, obviously not for students just to know physics facts or to know physics equations, right? Like, um, and it's even gone, it's not so much even so much for students to understand physics concepts even or to have correct concepts of physics, but it's can they understand how, how physicists think, what it's like to do physics. Uh, and so we always start with an observational experiment. We start with simply observing something, you know, so uh, here are two pieces of tape, you know, rip them apart, observe how they interact. Observe how they interact with your neighbor's tapes. Um, uh, find a pattern in that. What possible explanations could, could explain that pattern? You know, could it be magnetism? Could it be, you know, like, what could it be? And then how, come up with multiple explanations for that. And then for, for, for each possible explanation, what testing experiments could you do? How could you test that explanation? Design a testing experiment. What kind of experiments could we do? Um, and make a prediction for each testing experiment based on each explanation. So prediction is not what do you think will happen. It's, it's hypothetical deductive reasoning. So if this possible explanation is true and I do this experiment, then this would happen. And so it really gets at the heart of we can never prove something correct. We can disprove things, but we can, we can only find more and more uh, supporting evidence. Uh, we can never just, and th so then you get to the, the testing experiments and do, do the outcomes agree with the predictions? If yes, you can do more testing experiments or start to apply the idea. If no, you want to revisit. And we always want to make very clear, what are the assumptions we're making? We're always asking students, uh, solving every problem, what assumptions are you making? Um, a key tool that is very useful, how many people have heard, this is jargon, multiple representations. How many people happen to be familiar with this jargon and multiple representations? Okay, so not, not, not very many. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's physics, it's, um, so the idea is that uh, as, as an expert in my field, I can automatically see different representations of the same physics problem as the same thing. So I could see, you know, we have a ball rolling down a ramp, a physical thing. I could talk about the equation of that. I could talk about the forces on, I could draw a free body diagram. I could do an, I could talk about the energy transfer involved in that. Um, and then write out equations. So words, diagrams, words, equations, numbers, graphs, diagrams. I have ver many different ways of describing the same problem. And to me, it's, it's, I can see easily how it's all the same. 
if we can help students use multiple representations in, in their work, then they can, if, when, if a student can easily translate between words and equations and graphs and see how they are all connected and become fluent in translating among them, they start to think more, more like an expert. Um, how might either mul using multiple representations or, um, or the IELTS learning cycle apply in your context? Please keep that in mind as, as, we, as we do this. So again, the challenge is how do we take these, these great goals that we set at the beginning, these critical thinking, these high level goals. In my case, it's you know, thinking, uh, going through a process of evaluating evidence. And, and, and making decisions based on evidence, testing models with evidence, um, or using multiple representations and actually practice using them. Because we, we all know that if I get up here and show them how to use all the multiple representations, that won't help students at all, right? They need to cr actually be engaged in creating these representations to learn how to translate among them. How do I do this in Con Hall? So I'm gonna give you one example. This was partially inspired by, by Eugenia at Kina. She said, have them act it out. Because what we do have in Con Hall is a beautiful stage. So for the, non, for the benefit of the non-physicists in the room, when we have them play with the tapes, we establish that there are two kinds of stuff, just a quick summary. We establish there are two kinds of stuff, and we're going to name it positive and negative charge, and the plus and the plus repel, and the minus and the minus repel, and the minus and the plus attract. And we can represent, and then later on we get to, hey, we can represent these, a representation, the, the way charges affect the space around them, and the way they interact through these electric forces with these things called electric fields, or E field lines. And for the plus charge, do the field lines point towards or away from a plus charge? One, two, three. Away. For the minus charge, towards or away? Towards. Is that true over here, yes or no? One, two, three? Yeah. You need a more, <laughs> but you see, but that's but that's that's the beauty of it, right? It it catches me. No, it's that's a great moment, because to me it's totally clear, right? Right? And you haven't had time, but because of your reaction, I know I'm moving too fast. Is it the same over there? As as over there? So we said away for the top one, towards for the bot for the minus one. Does it, are, they, are they mostly doing that there too, the way the lines are going? Yes. Okay, wait, wait, five, one, two, three? Yes. Okay, cool, so we're seeing this pattern, this pattern in these field lines. And um, the other thing is, is so, so we will have played and we have know that the force is stronger between things. Um, are, are, so close to the charge, close to the charge, are the lines more densely packed or further apart? So dense or apart? close to the charge compared to further away from the charge. One, two, three? Yes. Okay, so we're seeing this pattern too, that the, that the field lines, and a, the denser lines means that the field is stronger there. It means a greater strength of the field. So now that we've, we've established this, our challenge will be to, what are the E field lines of a large, infinite, positively charged plate? And we will pretend that this stage is a large infinite and that it extends out, that the stage extends out and it is positively charged, uniformly positively charged. So it means the positive charges are spread out uniformly. The question is, what is the E field due to this plate? I will need six volunteers, five or six. You wanna co-create, right? So you, the vast auditorium, <coughs> have to tell the volunteers what to do, okay? You guys just have to do what they tell you, okay? <laughs> You're going to use your, 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 your index fingers to, to be the field lines. And so, you're, so this is positively charged. Again, remember before in the previous slide, we, we showed that, they were, that, they, that field lines point away from positive charge and towards negative charge. So in which direction, you know, up, down, left, right, in which direction should our volunteers point? One, two, three? Okay, or you can point. You point in the direction that they, you want them to point. How should they point? So this is a large, infinitely positive, large, large, infinite plate, uniformly charged positively. They are going, they are representing the field lines. You, they are the field lines. So yeah, so, 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 so I could be a field line going this way. If I curve, I can go this way, right? You can tell them to curve, right? So they, they, their bodies, their bodies vertically are representing the field lines. 
they pointing in the correct direction now? Yeah? yeah. OK. Um, now remember that the, the uh, density of the lines tells you the strength of the field, right? The density of the lines. So what this means right now is the field is really strong right here and not very strong over here. Is that accurate? If the, if the, if the positive charge density is the same everywhere. Is that, is that, are they standing correctly to represent the, the field everywhere above the stage? Do you guys agree? So somebody said they should be equally spaced. Do you guys agree, yes or no? Yes. Okay, can you guys do that? <coughs> okay. <laughs> and are they, are they, are they, are, should they be, are they straight or curved, these field lines? Absolutely straight. So that means they're effectively, are they parallel? You know, like they're effectively parallel. That I did tell you, I didn't break that down. Um, uh, so they're, they're parallel, that means the spacing between them stays constant as you go away from the plate, right? So we could have done more build up before this. I could have, well, I mean, like, so most people's intuition is that the, as, the, as I move away from the plate, the field would get weaker. Right? That would be your intuition. But based on this representation that we have here, we see that the field, does, does, the, does the distance between the lines change as you go further away from the plate? Yes or no? One, two, three? No. no. So does the strength of the electric field change as you move further away from the plate? Yes or no? No. No. Okay, because these, because they, their, because their, their, their fingers are, you know, they, they stay constant, right? If you go through the center, this represent what you saw with, with the, uh, with the physical representation of our volunteers. Yes or no? One, two, three. Yeah. <coughs> and so we have, we have this counterintuitive idea that you've just, that we've just co-created together, that uh, the, the field stays constant, uh, even as you go further away from the plate. And again, yeah, we. We would get lots of questions about this and discuss this before. So as I mentioned, this was my very first time teaching this large class. So as, as an example of like, hey, you know, just because you've been teaching a long time, everything you try, students love, you know, no, no, that's not true. <laughs> um, pick a learning goal or lesson that learners find challenging or one that you might like to do. You know, imagine your dream, you know, what's your dream large audience that you would get to address? And um, how, and how could you how could you apply this in your context? What like what could you have people act out, right? So again, the basic premise is you get volunteers to come up on to come up on stage and do the actual acting out, and then the audience has to tell them what to do. So the volunteers don't have to think. So it's really a co-creation of the large group audience with the people on stage.